This is your narrator, the man in black. Again about to introduce tonight's Columbia program, Suspense. The story is The Pit and the Pendulum by Edgar Allan Poe. The adaptation by John Dixon Carr. Our guest is the distinguished American actor, Mr. Henry Hull, who plays the part of a prisoner of the Spanish Inquisition. If you've been with us on these Tuesday nights, you will know that suspense is compounded of mystery, suspicion, and dangerous adventure to hold you in a precarious situation and withhold the solution until the last possible moment. And so it is with The Pit and the Pendulum and Mr. Hull's performance. We again hope to keep you in... Suspense. And now, The Pit and the Pendulum. I was sick, sick unto death with that long agony. And when at length they unbound me and I was permitted to sit, I felt that my senses were leaving me. The sound of the inquisitorial voices seemed merged in one dreamy, indeterminate hum. Yet, for a while, I saw, but without terrible an exaggeration, I saw the soft and nearly imperceptible waving of the sable draperies on the walls of the room. I saw the flames of the seven tall candles which burned on the table. I saw the lips of the black hooded judges, and these lips appeared to me white, white as paper, white as horror. I saw them writhe with a deadly locution. I saw them fashion the syllables of my name. Jean Delbray, Captain Jean Delbray. Good fathers, gentlemen. We hear you, my son. I, I am very weak and infirm. I've been confined for many months in a dungeon. I, I've been tormented by nightmares. A conscience, one trusts. Pray silence, Fra Antonio. Even, even now, I, I have no knowledge of where I am or to whom I may be speaking. You are speaking to me, my son. I am Fra Pedro de Espela. Prior of the Dominicans of Segovia and Grand Inquisitor of all Spain. Is this... Is this the court of the Inquisition? It is. Oh, then, then God help me. He will help you, my son, if you trust him. But I, I am a French officer. That is true. A soldier and creature of the Archfiend Napoleon Bonaparte. But a French officer nonetheless. A prisoner of war. By what right do you try me in this court? Let the clerk read the charges against this prisoner. Pray silence while the clerk reads the charges. The charges against the prisoner are as follows. In primus, that he is one Jean d'Albray, a captain of artillery in the army of Bonaparte, so-called emperor of the French. This means nothing, as the prisoner says. It is no crime. Proceed. Item, that on the fourth day of September in the year of our Lord, 188, that says Jean d'Albray did wear to spouse and marry the most noble lady, the Doña Beatrice Valdez, niece of the, and ward of the illustrious... One moment. Your Excellency spoke. Fra Antonio, was any cheat employed to trap this girl into marriage against her will? Mm, no, we have no actual evidence of any cheat. Was the girl of age? I believe so. Then wherefore is the prisoner here? This marriage was a deplorable thing, if you like. Bonaparte himself is almost at the gates of Madrid. His general, La Salle, menaces our city of Toledo itself. But lawful marriage, however regrettable, is no sin or crime. There are other matters in the indictment, I think. Then continue, but give us nothing that is not material. Item, that on the 12th of October, 188, the Sergeant d'Albray, being in command of a five-gun battery of light artillery, did direct the fire of his guns against the holy church of St. Martha the Innocent. What? And thereby, of his wicked malice, destroyed that church utterly. Captain d'Albray... Is this charge true? It is, yes. You admit it? Good father, hear what I have to say. The church blew up, I think. Would you boast of your sin, young man? It blew up because it was stored with kegs of gunpowder for your army. I had every right to fire on it. And that is all the defense you have to make? I tell you, I had every right to fire on it by military law. There is was military law above God's law? I, I don't know. 
I did my duty, that's all. Long live the Emperor! Captain Dalbray, mark what I say. No man, however great his heresy, is ever condemned to be burnt in the fire. The fire? In the fire. fire. If he first recant and acknowledge the error of his ways. But for you, Jean Dalbray, there can be no mercy, no pity, no atonement. The only sentence of this court can be death. Death. Yes. The secular or government arm to which we must release you has devised two ways of punishment in cases such as yours. You hear the tolling of the bell? I hear them. It is the procession of the condemned going to the auto de fe. Soon the yellow light of the flames will stream through the windows and flicker on floor and ceiling. Nunc et in hora mortis into his manibus domine. Most of those condemned out of mercy will be strangled before they are burned. It cannot be so with you, Jean Delbray. You must die in one of two ways, either with the direst of physical agony. A slow fire of green wood, iced bandages about the head and the heart so that the fire does not approach too quickly. Or else, Jean Delbray, you must die in a certain other way. I've done with this. Pass your sentence and let me go. The law does not permit me to tell you now what this other way is. The sentence of this court, therefore. I, I had swooned. Yet still, I would not say that all of consciousness was lost. In the deepest slumber, no. In delirium, no. In a swoon, no. In death, no. Even in the grave, all is not lost. There are shadows of memory which tell us indistinctly of tall figures that lifted me and bore me in silence down, down, still down, until a hideous dizziness oppressed me at that descent into the earth. Then... As consciousness swam back to my wits, darkness, a stone floor, and darkness. Oh, Beatrice, Beatrice, my wife, Beatrice. Did you call me, Jean? Beatrice, was that you who spoke? Yes, Jean. You were here in the dungeon of the Inquisition. I am not really speaking to you, my poor Jean. I am only in your imagination. Am I mad, then? No. But your brain is fevered. You only think you hear me. No, no, no. I, I do. I do. I hear you clearly. As clearly as I once heard in you. In the little church near the Abro where we were married. Yes, yes, yes. I, I destroyed that church, Beatrice. I had to. It was my commanding officer's order. I know, Jean. Be comforted. There are those who care. You won't leave me. As long as I am in your heart, I shall be here. I, I was strong once. Now, now I am weak. Once I was reckless. Now, now I am afraid. Where am I, Beatrice? What are they going to do to me? I cannot tell. Remember, my voice comes only from your own brain. Are you fettered? Fettered? I, uh, no. They've not chained you to the wall? Uh, no, no, no. They've, they've taken away my uniform. They've given me sandals and a robe of what feels like coarse Courage, but I'm, I'm still free. Ah, free. Take courage, Jean. Free. And in the grasp of the Inquisition, Beatrice. Yes, Jean. It's completely dark. There's hardly any air. I, I dread to get up. I dread to stretch out my hand. Suppose, suppose they've buried me alive. Courage. Can you stand up? I, I, I think so. Then walk. Walk as far as you can. Measure the limit of the cell. If this is not a tomb... You're right, Beatrice. That always. I'll, I'll try. Are you on your feet? Yes. Now, now pray. Pray for a poor devil who always meant well. One pace. Two pace. Three. Four. You are very weak, Jean. Rest a moment. Where are you now, Beatrice? In, in the flesh, I mean. You know that, Jean. In the old house by the olive grove, 
scorned of my people. Yes, I know it. Each morning I climb to the hilltop and watch. Go on, go on. Sometimes I think I hear gun wheels yes. rumble in the hills. Yes. And long moving columns yes. with the red dust rising above. Go on, go on. First come the heavy cavalry in plume crested helmets. Yes. On their flanks, wheeling like hawks, light hussars in blue and scarlet. And behind them, in a glitter of bayonets as vast as light points on the sea, yes. rank upon yes. rank, the long gray coats and the tall bearskin caps. The old guard and the grand army. It is only a vision, my dear one. They do not come. Ah, oh, will they? Will they ever come, Beatrice? I cannot tell. Then, then I must face what has been prepared for me. Walk again, Jean. Try. Keep your hand in front of you. This robe, this robe, it impedes me. The floor is treacherous with slime. But I'll try. Four paces. Five. Six. Seven. It can't be a tomb. Eight. Nine. Look out! Uh, I'm all right. I'm all right. I fell, I fell to my knees. I... The rope, the rope tripped me. My, my hand is in front of me. It's lower than my face, but I, I feel, I feel nothing. Nothing, Jean. It's a pit, a circular pit. And I fell on the very edge of it. Oh, they would have made you walk into it. Yes. Oh, there, there's a loose fragment of rock just inside the edge. But if I can dislodge it, it might be listen. <laughs> There's, there's something down there. Rats, it may be. Rats, yes, but something else. I, I heard it move. So did I. What is in the pit, Sean? I don't know. But I... you're saved. Uh, uh, saved, Beatrice. Saved from the Inquisition. <laughs> my, my torture has been merely postponed. Deep sleep fell upon me. Sleep like that of death. How long it lasted, I, I know not. But when I opened my eyes once again, I could see. Yes, see. My prison was large and lofty. Its walls formed a massive iron plates bolted or joined together. A wild, sulfurous luster, I could not trace its origin, lit up the dungeon and the circular pit and the crudely daubed skeleton figures painted in evil colors on the iron walls. Skeleton figures, demon figures, gargoyle figures. The colors a little blurred as from the effects of the damp. It must approach you slowly and force itself into your mind. It must stalk you like a tiger. It must bring you face to face at last with the king of terrors. When I, when I regained consciousness, I lay on my back and at full length on a low framework of wood. To this framework, I was securely bound by a long fastening resembling a surgical bandage. Bound? But why? 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 The bandage passed round and round my body, leaving at liberty only my head and my left arm. With much exertion, I could supply myself with food from an earthen dish on the floor beside me. It was meat, highly seasoned, but there was no water. Beatrice! Beatrice, where are you? Here, Jean, as always. Your voice sounds stronger. Does it, Jean? And I, I can see you now. I can see you as clearly as I saw you months ago. Oh, I wish it were true. Your bonnet and the parasol you carried in summer and the high-waisted blue dress. You are weaker, my dear, and more uh, fevered. Have I... Have I been asleep? Yes, John. They must have been here while I slept. They have bound me. Why? Why? 
Why? Why? Stop those voices! Why? Stop them! Mine Why? too, Jean. Why? I am not here either, you Why? know. Don't drive me away. Beatrice, Beatrice, look, look, look. Where? At the ceiling of this room, 30, 40 feet up, what do you see? I see painted on the ceiling a figure of Father Time. Anything else? But Father Time carries no sign. No. He carries instead what looks like a gigantic pendulum from an ancient clock. About one thing, I swear I'm in my right senses. I saw that pendulum move. A painting cannot move. Yet I swear the pendulum did move. It swung a little back and forth, just like... A real pendulum. Try not to trouble your brain. That pendulum is real. Beatrice, Beatrice, take care. Take care of what? You're not looking at the pendulum now. Take care of the rats, the rats from the pit. I see them. They're swarming out in dozens. You can see their eyes glitter. One of them ran across the hem of your dress. Did it, Sean? What did they want? They caught the scent of the meat in the dish beside you. But they'll not get it. Go away, go away, you vermin. Move your hand above the plate, Jean. Move. Beatrice, Beatrice, where are you going? I could hardly hear you. You are sending me away, Jean. I am sending you away. My poor loved one. You can't bear to see the rats running about my feet. Beatrice! 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 Yes. Yes, it's true. In a cell swarming with vermin. There are others I had rather see here. I'd rather see... You call me Captain Dalbray. Then, in spirit, I am here. Who are you? Don't you recognize me? No, I do not. I am that second inquisitor, Fra Antonio, whom you thought unfair at your trial. But we were not unfair. We administer the law. That is all. So, I command you, go. Not until I have first told you what you already get. Which is... There are two forms of death for such as you. One, death with its direst physical torture. The other, death with its direst mental torture. And I, I have been condemned to the second? Your guess is good. Listen. Yes. Do you hear anything? Yes, yes, I do. I, I hear something. Turn your eyes upwards. Look at the ceiling. The pendulum. Aye, the pendulum. It's descended. Only a foot or so, as yet. As you notice, it is not really a pendulum. Its underside is a crescent, formed of sharp, of razor-sharp steel. You mean... A ponderous weight, Captain Dalbray. Its movement is slow now. But soon it will take on momentum. It will swing wider and wider. Thirty feet, perhaps. Presently, as it swings, you will hear it hiss. And with each broad movement, it will creep a trifle lower. The steel is directly above me. Yes. Above the region of your heart. Ah. Lie still and look up at it. How? How long before? You need have no immediate fear. It will not be too soon. But how soon? Who can tell? In the name of pity, give me some answer. Hours, perhaps days. It's beginning to swing wider. I, I can't take my eyes from it. Its glitter fascinates you. Eh? See how it shines in that wild light. And this is your utmost refinement in cruelty. The law, Captain Dalbray, is never cruel. And now, still in spirit, I leave you to your meditations. It will not be too soon. Minutes, hours, days. <laughs> Down, steadily down it crept. Days passed. It might have been many days before it, it swept so closely as to fan me with its morbid breath. Minutes, hours, days. 
The odor of the sharp steel forced itself into my nostrils. The right. To the left. Far and wide. The shriek of a damned spirit. To my heart. With the stealthy pace of a tiger. Down. Certainly. Relentlessly. Down. I I prayed. I wearied heaven with my prayer for its more speedy descent. I grew frantically mad and struggled to force myself up against that swinging, glittering death. Ah, of no avail. Down, still unceasingly, still inevitably down. The sharp steel flashed past within three inches of my chest. Bill. Beatrice! John! Beatrice, spirit, where are you? I heard you calling, John. I am here. It is a strange thing, Beatrice. I'm quite calm. You are resigned, then. No. That is the strange thing. Even now, I am not resigned. Is there a way out? How can there be? Ten, twelve more vibrations, and will fray the surge of my robe. Only lightly as a razor in a delicate hand. There will be many sweeps before it bites deep. No, I can't escape it. You kept me away from you, Jean. You locked me out of your thoughts. If I am here only in your thoughts, why should I fear the rats? The rats! You open your eyes and your eyes blaze. What is it? The rats! Do they, do they still swarm here? Across the floor and over the meat platter. They have taken nearly all your food. Yes, 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 of course, they are ravenous. And they have sharp teeth. Well? The meat is oily and spiced. If I take what remains of it, scatter, you vermin! And rub that meat from the bandages that hold me here. Try it, John, try it. may be too late. If I leave my body a fraction of an inch up. Try it, I tell you, try it. Ah, but look, they scatter as soon as I do try. But they are watching you. I can see their eyes. Look, they're creeping back. Can I stand the rats crawling across me? Can the flesh bear? One of them has leaped on the wooden framework. Another followed. They're gnawing at the bandage. Seven, eight more sweeps of the pendulum. And the bandage give way. A little Lie still, Jean, lie still. Ten, twelve, a dozen rats now. Is death, I wonder, worse than this disgust? A dozen sharp knives could do no better. The bandage is loosened to ribbons. Now, if you move sideways, yes. carefully, yes. and drop to the floor. Ah, Beatrice, I can't move. My arms and my legs are numb. There is no power The steel to... has frayed your robe. A minute more will be too late. Then, Try. Then, with all the strength that is in me, and all the hate that I bear my enemies... Free! A second time. Free! Pendulum stop. They are drawing it back up through the roof. Each move I make, they watched. You never doubted. Yet with all they could do to you, they have failed twice. They will not fail. No more dallying with the king of terrors. What else can they do? I can't say. See, see how the rats gnaw in silence at that bandage. To what food, I wonder... But you escaped the pit. I escaped it once. Listen. What do you hear? A groaning. Uh, yeah, it's a uh, grinding as of metal. It was only the cog wheels of the pendulum. Uh, I think not, Beatrice. Why not? It seemed to come from behind those iron-plated walls. It seems to shake the dungeon as a mill wheel might shake it. it. Stand up, my poor Jean. Get up off your knees. I can't, Beatrice. I can't endure any more. The paintings on the walls of this dungeon... The skeletons and imps and devils, they seem different. They are different. The color sharpen and grow bright. The demon's eyes glare. The skeleton hands are stretched. Don't you catch even yet the odor of heated iron? Heated iron? Beatrice, my darling, I... I have been much humbled. But I won't... I won't have you see me in tears. I, I order you to go. John... In the name of heaven, Beatrice. you're sending me away. Yes, yes, Come. in the name of heaven, go, go. A suffocating heat pervaded the prison. A deeper glow settled in the painted eyes that glared at me. 
I could draw no breath of air into my lungs. Against the loom of that fiery destruction, the thought of the pit and its coolness come like a soothing balm. I staggered to the edge of the pit. I looked into it. The enkindled walls and roof lighted it to its depths. Yet for one wild moment, even then, I refused to believe the horror of what I saw beneath me. Does the pit please you, Captain Dalbray? Does the pit! Merciful God, anything but that! And how shall you avoid it? Look. This dungeon has changed its shape. That is true. The walls are closing in. It was formerly a square. And now it is flattening slowly toward the center to force me into the pit. Of course. Ah, well, it'll force you along with me. Again, apparently you must be told, Captain Galbraith, that you are speaking only to your own sick fancy. I am not here at all. Farewell. And now, now closer and closer through the red burning walls forcing me into the pit with a swiftness that left me no time for thought. I shrank back, but the closing walls pressed me relentlessly onward. At length, for my seared and writhing body, there was no longer an inch of foothold. I, I screamed once. I started on the edge of the pit. <laughs> rushed back, an outstretched arm caught my own as I was about to fall, fainting into the abyss. It was that of General La Salle. The French army had entered Toledo. The Inquisition was in the hands of its enemies. Vive La Salle! And so closes Poe's celebrated story, The Pit and the Pendulum, starring Henry Hull. We invite you to another adventure of suspense next Tuesday at the same hour. Until then, this is the man in black saying good night. William Spear, the producer, John Dietz, the director, Bernard Herman, the composer conductor, and John Dixon Carr, the author, are collaborators on The Spence. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>